Hello everybody, I hope you guys are doing well so far today, and I figured it was time to take a look at the damage. I wanted to take a look at the damage wrought by the Seahawks in pass protection. And note that I say pass protection, not necessarily offensive line, and yes, there is a little bit of a difference there. So, last few games the Seahawks have played, I've used PFF to get an idea of how much pressure the Seahawks are generating on defense. But I think this week we're going to have to switch things up and take a look at how much pressure the Seahawks allowed on offense. Because I, I, I don't think I need to tell you guys this. I think it was pretty obvious based on the way that game went down. It wasn't pretty. It wasn't good. And I want to uh, kind of assess the damage here and talk about it a little bit so we understand where the problem really stems from. So let's start by going player by player on the offensive line because... The offensive line did not play well. There's no way around that one. And it starts with them. The issues that we had protecting the quarterback start up there. And if you go down the list here, you can see the problem is not just that there was a lot of pressure. There was a lot of pressure coming from everywhere. Like it starts with Charles Cross on the left side. He allowed four pressures in that game. Now, I'm not drilling Charles Cross. He's going up against... Trey Hendrickson, who's having an amazing year so far. I'm not saying this is the worst thing in the world. He didn't allow any sacks, but he he gave up some stuff for sure. There's no doubt about it. I, I don't think anything, there's no but you can really put in there that excuses the fact that he allowed four pressures in a game at left tackle, and he's going to have to be better going forward. I think he will be. I think this was his first game back from an injury, and that definitely had a negative effect. Move along to Phil Haynes over on left guard this time. And um, yeah, he can't play left guard. <laughs> he cannot play left guard anymore. I don't know what happened. He used to be much better at the left guard than he was at the right guard. Doesn't seem like it's the case anymore. He allows four pressures and two sacks. Just him. Four pressures on Geno and two sacks. So the ugliness continues. You move along the line here. Evan Brown, not so bad. Three QB, I'm sorry, two QB pressures allowed by Evan Brown. I mean, he's a center, so he shouldn't really be allowing that many anyway. So I guess you could say that two is still a pretty significant amount, but it's not really a huge problem, but it's present. It's definitely something there. It's not a shutdown game. He is capable of having shutdown games. First two games of the year, Evan Brown allowed a total of zero pressure, so he's capable of doing better than that. Anthony Bradford, you move along to Anthony Bradford. Now, he had a good game, but he gave up some stuff in pass protection. Three QB pressures two hits, and one hurry, so zero sacks, and his work in run blocking, according to PFF, was incredible, but it's still three pressures, and that kind of saves the best or worst for last, because we got Jake Curhan here, who has gotten lit up three weeks in a row, completely lit up, arguably, as a pass protector, he's been lit up in every game this year, he's not a bad player, he's just, he's just critically flawed in this area, and we as uh, we as an offense just need something better. He's a backup for a reason. He fought hard while he was in there. He did what he could, but this is just who he is. And this was probably, well, I mean, it's certainly arguable, but this may have been his worst game. Seven pressures allowed just on his head. And he's not the one dealing with Geno's blind side. He's dealing with Geno's front side. So... You've got some pretty bad performances in here in pass protection, but the real issue is, as I see it, it's coming from everywhere. Everybody's allowing stuff in pass protection. There's no one guy on the offensive line who was just locking down. Like, you talk about wanting Geno to step up in the pocket, and there are definitely some plays there, but you can see the interior offensive line guys are allow allowing a lot of leakage. Those three guys alone allowed nine of the pressures. And then the tackles, you throw them in, you're up to 20 QB pressures allowed just by the five starting offensive linemen. So that's where this can be better, right? Because Phil Haynes is going to move back to right guard, which some way, somehow, he's a better right guard now than left guard. I don't know when it happened, but it looks like it happened to me. Bradford's going to hit the bench, and I know some people are going to say, I really like Bradford, I don't want him to hit the bench, but... I think overall we're getting better stuff with Phil Haynes on the right side and Damian Lewis on the left side. Maybe at some point this season I'll change my mind on that, but as of right now I feel like that's the best bet. You're going to get Kerhan out and Abe Lucas in. Abe Lucas is a much better all-around player than Kerhan. So this is just going to get better just by virtue of the fact that we get our players back. 
we've got two backups and one guy playing out of position. That's tough to overcome. So that part, I'm not really trying to run anybody down here. You look at the Next Gen Stats tweet, the Bengals are the fourth team to have four different players generate at least six pressures in a game since 2020. Sam Hubbard had nine pressures. And by the way, they gave Curhan worse than PFF did. They said he gave up eight pressures. Trey Hendrickson had seven. DJ Reader had six. BJ Hill had six. So again, it came from everywhere. There's no one area that Geno could feel comfortable about as a quarterback that it was going to protect him, that it was going to work. So I look at something like this and I go, you can deal with one or two guys giving up a lot of pressures, but you can't necessarily deal with everybody giving up pressures because then you've got nowhere to look when the going gets tough. You've got nowhere to step up to. You've got nowhere to move to because everybody's just not really performing all that well and you get what you get. Uh, To kind of put it into further context, we have this stat to look at from a John P. Gilbert on X. Daniel Jones against the Seahawks a couple weeks ago was pressured on 46% of his dropbacks. Geno Smith in this game got pressured on almost the exact same number of his dropbacks. So you may have not noticed it because Geno only took four sacks whereas Daniel Jones took 11, but the Seahawks offensive line did more or less as bad of a job protecting Geno as the Giants' offensive line did protecting Daniel Jones two weeks ago. Now, remember, I said pass protection, not just the offensive line. reason why I said that is it's not just the offensive line. It's on Geno. You guys have seen the screenshots by now. You guys have seen JSN wide open for two touchdowns, and it looks like Geno's looking at him. looks like Geno has the ability to get the ball to him, and he doesn't. It It's confounding. It's confusing. It's not something that I'm okay with. Again, I'm going to say it's just a bad game and I'm not going to read into it more than that. We don't need to. I don't feel the need to say, oh, he's bad now because he missed a few plays in this game. But Gino missed those opportunities when he did actually have time, when he had a pocket. The abil- he, he needs to get the ball out of his hands when he's got a play in front of him. The way defenses are playing in the modern NFL right now, you have to take what the defense gives you every time. So yeah, there is definitely part of all these pressures that is on Geno. Geno needs to get the ball out quicker. And as a quarterback, you can get pressured and still make a good play. We see it all the time. The Lions got pressure on Geno in week two, but Geno never let it affect him. Geno found ways to get the ball out, hit receivers, make plays, and put up, ultimately at the end of the day, 37 points, uh, 31 because of the pick six if you want to take that out, Um, because when he got pressured, he got the ball out, made decisive good decisions, and won the game. So, Geno's got his part in this as well. And then you have the third part of this, which is, of course, the play calling and scheme. I want to go to this tweet by Brady Henderson. Seattle had much more of a downfield passing game in this game than other games. Over the first four games, Geno ranked last in the league in air yards per attempt at six. Against the Bengals, he was 11th with eight. So his average air yards per attempt went up two whole yards in this game. And I love downfield passing. I love big plays. I love bombs. And we absolutely need that to be part of our offense. But with the way this game went, I think you can very safely say that maybe we got a little greedy. Maybe we pushed it just a little too much because we thought, hey, Charles Cross is back. Now we can run more of our playbook. And it had mixed results. And again, there were some plays where it probably would have worked, like the JSN touchdowns, the DK touchdowns, but there were other plays where receivers were open, but by the time they got open, Gino was already running for his life and had no opportunity to get the ball to the open receiver. There were other plays where there weren't open receivers and Gino would just stand there, look, 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 and then throw it away or take a sack or whatever it may be. So everything is connected is what I'm trying to get at here, really. Like you've got... The play of the offensive line, you've got the play of the quarterback, and you've got the scheme and the play calls of the offensive coordinator. None of it was good enough. And that's how you get a game like this, where your offensive line is giving up 20 pressures in a game. Your quarterback is not responding well to those pressures. He's taking, he's turning those pressures into negative plays, whereas we've seen Geno be very good when pressured. We've seen Geno be able to get the ball out quickly. And you have an offensive coordinator that thinks his pass protection is better than it is. 
So all these things came together to produce what we saw on Sunday. And again, I think the most important thing to keep in mind here is it's it's a bad game. It's a bad game by this offense that has been better than it has any right to be this season. We have had significant injuries to four of our starting offensive linemen this year, and the one guy who's been consistently healthy played out of position for part of the season. So the offensive line has been in shambles. We have no right having a decent offense, and we do. Even after that game, collectively speaking, over the season, we have a good offense, or at least an above-average offense. So I'm not going to let this define who I think these players are, especially the offensive line because they've got injuries. The players are going to get back. But I'm not going to let this game define what I think of Geno at the end of the day, and I'm not going to let it define what I think of Waldron. I like both those guys. They did a great job last year, and I think, all things considered, they have done a good job before Sunday's game. So we're going to have to see where this goes, but I think there is some reason for optimism in here. I, I think that losing that game is painful because you played well enough to win on one side of the ball twice over, and you couldn't get it done. But that being said, that doesn't mean there isn't a lot of stuff to be happy about going into the next game. And we'll talk more about that later on, but I'm going to get out of here. More videos later. Go Hawks, and uh, see you guys later.